All right, so my topic for today is how to understand, sorry, understand how to budget for social media marketing efforts. Uh, lots of different areas to cover. I'm super excited about this. A little bit about me. My name is Taylor Ryan. I am the CEO of Clint and Growth Secrets. Clint is a digital marketing agency and growth hacking firm. Growth Secrets is my online masterclass. I have 13 years of marketing and startup experience. I'm originally from Washington, DC, but now I live in Copenhagen, Denmark and have been for the last six years. I'm a six time startup founder. Uh, as of last year, I was a finalist for Ecosystem Hero of the Year. I work with tons of startup accelerators. I'm a board member. I do tons of mentoring of different startups. I work with lots of global accelerators. Uh, happy to chat after this if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. But yeah, let's move on. Over the last five years, uh, four and a half, I've built up and exited or helped startups to exit uh, that resulted in one IPO, two acquisitions, and one merger as either the chief marketing officer or the person leading the marketing. So my perspective is coming from a bit more of the marketing leadership as opposed to anything else. Uh, I usually run teams between 15 and 30, or at least have been over the last five years, uh, and I've covered over yeah, all that stuff. Again, Clint is my agency. Look me up, clintmarketing.com or Growth Hacking Digital Marketing Agency. I also run Growth Secrets, which I've mentioned enough as is. And yeah, I do kind of full service marketing and a lot of the growth hacks that I implement into my own companies and the companies that I've worked with, they all have this really nice kind of growth pattern. And I'm gonna show some people how I go about doing that throughout this presentation. My goal for today is to provide a ton of value. Uh, there's so much, I would say, detail in these that I, I tried to kind of back out in moments, but I know I'm going to lose some people as we go. I hope they record this and I hope it's a value. So let's rock and roll. Um, so yeah, I already hit that while you're here in the value. So cool. I'm going to be covering a ton of ground. Uh, the most important thing is budgets. So budgets across marketing departments, digital ads, digital ad channels, predictable ROI, forecasting, setting a minimum budget and then influencer marketing, which I think is super interesting and not a lot of people, at least as I've heard, have talked about it much. So before we start, uh, there is a poll that needs to be uh, triggered and, and I would say I have to back out of this in order to get it to, to go, I guess. Andre's gonna help me out with that, but I'm supposed to, yeah, publish that, great. So let me hop back. This is so crazy to try to do it this way. Um, yeah, let me go back in. Cool. So let's agree on a few things uh, before we get started. First things first, every industry is different. I, I know that a lot of people are going to be like, yeah, but like this one time when I experienced it, it's like, yeah, I know, you're in a completely different industry. And by that standard, every product and service are going to be vastly different in the way that we build out not only our ads, but across different funnels. There's so many different things to bear in mind. And of course, every business model is going to be different depending on how and what you're selling. So there are so many different little areas that are broken up into this. And by that standard, we know that every target audience is going to be very different. The people that actually buy our products and services. And by that standard, then we know that the digital ad platforms are going to be super different. And the way that we actually initiate campaigns on these is going to depend on all of the things that I've previously mentioned. And by that standard, we also note the offers and the different types of conversions, depending on all the things that I previously mentioned, are also different. And by that standard, we know that every funnel is going to be wildly different. So every business, for the most part, should have a very unique funnel because every business is just different enough. So I'm going to cover as much ground as possible, but bear in mind that there's not going to be a perfect fit that it's like one person I'm directly speaking to because there's so many different areas to cover. So a few other big themes that I think are super important people always miss, save as much time as you can where you can. And you don't have to build stuff from zero. So I'm going to show a couple of growth hacks or ways of working around it or just really kind of no brainer things that are going to save you time. Map your user flow to save tons of time. I have mapped hundreds of funnels over the years and it definitely saves me time to figure out where I'm losing potential ROI, where I'm losing people with sales compliance, with defining different parts of the funnel. It's super helpful to use. The tools at the bottom are the different ones that you can use. Draw.io is probably my favorite. Uh, Giru is one that targets anybody that's a digital marketer on Facebook. You've probably seen the ads. Uh, and then there are lots of ad spend calculators. So rather than taking the time to build out a Google Sheet or an Excel doc that nobody's going to look at, just use something that's 
at least started or somebody's built out already in order to get the ball rolling so that you're not having to learn from zero. Uh, and then, yeah, use industry and channel averages. And I'll go into some of these later, but this is gonna save tons of time. This is great for forecasting and also knowing kind of whether or not what you're doing is actually working. And I'm actually gonna set a timer here because I wanna make sure that I save tons of time for questions because uh, I move really fast, as I mentioned, and there's inherently lots of questions. So you can measure positive ROI from paid social media. And there are thousands of case studies that show that. It's a lot of hustle porn, like I made a million dollars this year by Facebook. So it is possible, we know it is. Uh, and the reality is there are different things that you can do in order to get you there. And I do think it is important to note that there is short-term benefits, but they expand over the long-term is what you can see on the right side. So let's dive into like the big picture stuff. So like, what should I have as, let's say you're CMO and what, what is my marketing budget compared to the rest of the company? And that's a tough one, right? So what percentage of the total company yearly revenue should be allocated to marketing? And there is a poll that you could answer that would be really helpful because I call BS on most of the surveys that are out there. So if you have a moment on the right side, you can go into the poll. Uh, total revenue that should be spent on marketing really depends on the business, but the averages that I've been able to source are anywhere from 5% upwards of 40%, which is absolutely absurd. The 40% is more startups and stuff like that. This really depends and hinges upon what your major goals are and what your product is doing and how well it's being received by the market. There are so many variables, but five to 40% is a pretty like wide range. So I heard somebody reference it earlier. I'm also going to reference it a bunch. The CMO, uh, CMO survey by Deloitte uh, had a bunch of CMOs answer this stuff. And I'm going to challenge a bunch of stuff that comes out of that. But apparently, the industry of consumer packaged goods spends the most by percentage of total revenue on marketing. And you can look at the other ones in here. It's a great little report. Um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of doubts that I have on it. And I'll explain in the next slide. But you can see that there's some slight differences between B2B product and services and B2C product and services. By and large, there's a lot of different ways that you could chart the data out on this, but it's a long way to go to say that anywhere from 10 to 18% of total revenue should go into digital marketing, all things digital marketing. So I like to use kind of the practical example of, let's say we just wanna grow the total revenue by 5%. Here's how I am able to somehow calculate through magic how much I should be spending on marketing. So I take my goal of annual recurring revenue and my current annual recurring revenue, ARR, and that's 200 and 200, which is no difference. And I'm basically taking the 5% of the total budget and sticking it back in, which is now, hey, 10 million for the year. That's my budget. Another way to do this is if I wanted rapid growth, then I would basically use a similar equation, which basically is uh, subtracting the goal versus the current. That's the growth delta and then taking 40% of that which comes out to 800,000, which is still pretty darn good. So that's probably the most detailed I'm gonna get into like digital budgets on a grand scale. Let's go a little more granular. So what's the total budget for digital ads? Cause marketing has lots of stuff going on. What percentage of the marketing budget should be allocated just to digital ads? And I'm sure if there's anybody in here that has been a marketer, is like a single marketer within a company, or they're on a team, or maybe they're the chief marketing officer or somebody that's managing a bunch of marketers. We all know that it's basically like repairing a car that's already moving. And so one little area of, of marketing that we're trying to kind of figure out budgets while other parts are still going is super difficult. But I'm gonna try, I'm gonna show you a couple of different ways to do it. Um, but yeah, let's focus in on paid, paid digital advertising alongside media spend. So a Gantt, uh, sorry, Gartner uh, uh, poll that went out to a bunch of people, there were 398 respondents. The average that came out for digital ads was 11.2 and search ads, uh, which was 9.7. I call bullshit. Um, there's just way too many variables in there for that to actually be accurate across any industry as a whole. Um, it's just not realistic. So I would say, you know, take this with a grain of salt. But if you're somewhere within this range, realize that you're doing okay. So we're saying 11.2% to 9.7% on either one of these channels as the percentage of total marketing spend. So how do we choose the right paid digital channels? And there's a lot of different ways to look at this. I get this question all the time, which is which digital ads channel is the best? 
Like, all right, well, the best for what? Like, what, it, what is that question? Like, who do you want to reach? What's the goal? And there are so many different ways to answer that question because there are so many different options and so many different platforms. So let's try to pick this apart really quickly. Just remember from the previous slides that I've shown, every business model, product, et cetera, is going to be wildly different and every offering on every platform is going to be different. There are lots of different possibilities. In my eyes, it breaks into two very distinct areas. We have B2B, which is an area that I play in about 75% of the time, and B2C, which is business to consumer, I'm like 25% of the time. Simpler funnels equal more conversions, more steps equals less conversions. It all kind of makes sense. Let's move into it. So B2B, the icons, the logos that are really big are the ones that I focus on, especially if they don't have a lot of early traction. So you're looking at Google ads and LinkedIn across the board for B2B. There are certainly plays where it would make sense to incorporate other things, but you can see all the way through the standard marketing funnel, awareness, interest, decision, action. There are different avenues for different types of ads throughout the entire thing. And those have to be in your funnel because otherwise you're just missing stuff. I do not have enough time to get into basic targeting strategies. Uh, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, to be honest. It's, it's not even that much fun, but I think of it as, a spear versus a net when you're really targeting a, a super tight group of people. There might only be 250 people on the entire planet in the entire universe that we know of that would buy from you. So it's a really unique play and there's lots of different ways to look at it. I've always had this major challenge of doing bottom up versus top down. So everybody's like, oh, it's the CEO. He's going to buy our stuff. And it's like, no, dude, the CEO signs the check. You need to get either a manager or a director to have buy-in to understand exactly how you're going to help solve their problems. And then they feed it upwards and upwards and upwards until eventually somebody signs the check or the invoice or whatever the case is. And that's a really difficult thing to, to get in front of a bunch of, yeah, sometimes hard-nosed uh, execs and say, look, you're wrong. And the data will show it, you know, like let's, let's put numbers to it. I digress. B2C, digital ad networks. So I always start with search ads to really hammer down a lot of different intent. I do a lot of testing on that, but depending on the nature of the product or service, I think a lot of the different platforms are relatively equal and there's lots of different ways to play it. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. With B2C targeting strategies, this is more of the net versus the spear. You're casting a really wide net in order to see what you pull in and continue to optimize. I don't have a ton of time to go into targeting and buyer personas, so I won't. The hardest thing about getting into this for those that are maybe early within building out ads across different channels is that there's conflicting advice everywhere. Everybody's gonna tell you something different. And so I remember looking up, you know, in the earliest days, like, oh, you're gonna wanna do this 100% of the time, regardless of the industry. And then you look in a, a different video and somebody else is saying completely the opposite. And this is an example where somebody's like, 20% audience building, 20% retargeting, 60% on offers and promotion. And then when you look at somebody else and say, this is God-given truth, this is the way it's done, 60% audience, and so on. So take it with a grain of salt. You're going to have to do your own testing in order to figure out what works for you. There are so many different bidding strategies that I'd love to take time to kind of go through. But, you know, honestly, I run an agency for this, so I would love to actually have people as a client. Uh, but holler at your boy, clintmarketing.com, happy to talk. Uh, the biggest thing that you can take away from some of these, these really basic ideas, different channels, is win on one to two first. This will allow you to solidify your messaging. It also helps to really figure out your targeting, your intent, make the visual and ad copy pair up to get the highest level or number of conversions, and then you can play with different offers across different platforms. But if you don't, let, like, if you don't actually win on one to two first, then you're just trying too many things, you're burning up budgets. And you can also hire Clint because we can do that for you. Uh, focus on conversion rate optimization before you ever run a single ad. Conversion rate optimization is how easy it is for somebody to actually convert or do the thing that you want them to do on your website. I cannot drive a ton of traffic to a site that doesn't convert because they're going to look at me and be like, bruh, what did you actually do for us? You haven't gotten us any movement in terms of ROI or bringing in money. And for, again, like I heard this like thing about like, Bad bosses like looking at data. It's like, no, that's what the people at the very top of a company are paid to do or have to do in order to make sure we all have jobs. So it's super important that you can tie stuff to ROI or bringing in revenue. And yeah, I run a couple of my own companies. So like, yeah, I guess I am that boss. Like if we agree to do something, we're going to do it. And we have to be able to trace the very long route or short one 
of how this will eventually result in us getting some form of return on investment. And if that can't be shown over a really long map or even a short one, we're not doing it. Uh, and oh yeah, by the way, I do run an agency. It's called ClintMarketing.com, Clint for short. Please check us out on the growth hacking and uh, digital marketing firm. There is another poll in there that uh, if you wanna answer that, I think that would be interesting. Uh, moving right along, I want to show how we can start getting predictable revenue uh, or at least start looking at doing that with funnel data. And this can be super difficult for some people. It depends on the nature of your industry. I'm not going to go into like crazy amounts of stuff with funnels, but we can start to figure out what are the metrics of every step of the funnel and then put numbers to that and start to predict on some regular basis how many people that enter our funnel will come out the under other end as either deals won or customers. And unfortunately, I know this is not the sexiest part of marketing. I didn't get into marketing for this. Like I want to create cool shit, but I'm now into this because it is interesting when you actually put numbers to it. You can find out for every 10,000 people, how many people end up at the very bottom. And this is what your boss gets excited about. Or if you are the boss, this is what you should be thinking about when you wake up in the morning. How can I take each step and make sure that I'm getting a percentage higher in each of them? in order to continue to hire more people, in order to continue to do fun shit that we all enjoy doing within marketing. So it's a huge advantage to actually start monetizing, well, figure out how to monetize your funnel by continuing to get higher percentages across all of these. For the record, MQL marketing qualified leads are when we get people to convert and we're like, yep, yeah, passes the sniff test. Sales qualified leads are basically when sales is like, yeah, it's a good lead. Sales loves to burn leads from marketing. For anybody that's worked in a B2B environment, you'll know this. Uh, there's lots of lead scoring tools and I could go on for ages about that, but I wanna move on. It's the same thing with B2C. I've done a lot of ASO, app store optimization, along with building out funnels for lots of different B2C companies. And I have to tell you, there are so many different steps. So think about it, if you have an app that requires people to put in a credit card in order for you to get paid, there is a very long process to get there. So they got to go to the app store from whatever your ad was telling them to do. They have to install and hopefully they have Wi-Fi. Then they have to launch the app. They start the registra registration, complete the registration, add a product to the cart, begin the checkout, and then complete the checkout. It is so painful to see all of these people come in your funnel just to end up with very little. And this is what we continue to have to turn the screws on as marketers. And by the way, this is a huge deal. If you're still like into marketing after the end of this, I'm telling you, this is how you future proof yourself is really understanding the numbers behind it. Basic e-commerce funnel, this would be in, like an example of like a great one. So if all the campaign impressions, you know, came out and you had the standard click through rates, which is 0.89 on display ads, and you're bringing in of those people 7%, they get to the, the landing page and they convert, and then you're finally able to convert them in a future email at 7%. You're looking at 4.4 sales per every 10,000 uh, impressions or people that get to your site. If your product costs more than $20, sorry, less than $20, then you've basically made a, a decent ROI or a positive ROI. As the person that was running the company, I'd be like, that's fantastic. Do more of that. Here's more money and here's a promotion. If you can do that, you are putting yourself into a really great spot as a future-proof marketer, uh, marketer, I promise. So digital ads budgets. I've tried to run my team through this and I could tell some of them got a little spacey. So I'm not going to put uh, you guys through all this, but there are ways to calculate everything. They're really publicly available. The cost per impression is <laughs> total campaign spend divided by number of impressions, like super straightforward. Uh, I do think that this is interesting stuff. I just don't think it's as sexy as I maybe think it is. So I think a lot of people are going to zone out. Um, but I can calculate the cost per click. A lot of platforms give it to you right away automatically, which is fantastic. I can get the conversion rate. Uh, and this is across all platforms, by the way. So I'm taking data from all platforms and putting it together. So if I wanted the conversion rate, cool. I have that for every potential step of the funnel. I can do that. If I were trying to get the cost per action, and I can't remember uh, the lady's name, but she has the same last name as me, Ryan, but she was talking about there are lots of different actions, which I totally agree with. And so if we have one specific action that we're really trying to measure, we could certainly do that, which gives us a really good understanding of how much every lead costs, which is super important. And then we're able to kind of stack these things up and get a good feel for eventually the stuff that really matters 
a couple of other spots in the funnel. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have you deal with that. The most important thing that I want to know as the chief marketing officer, and I've been one for nearly five years in other companies, and uh, I've been running my own agency for the last two. I want to know these numbers: the customer acquisition cost. How much do I have to spend in order to get a new customer? This is super powerful. And so that also allows you to project across other platforms and for the future. I want to know what my margin rate is. So the amount of money that I, I basically lose by producing the product or building the product or whatever the case is. Uh, and it's the cost of, of basically the goods there divided by the revenue. I want to know what my total profit is, my churn rate. So it's the number of lost customers divided by the total customers. And you just set different time periods to determine, aha, uh -huh, the customer lifetime value so I can project in the future. For anybody that's building a startup, you need to know this shit. And if you don't, you're gonna get laughed out of the room when investors are talking with you. Please figure this stuff out. It's super easy, I promise, and you'll get my slides. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Again, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but I wanna move on. So what percentage of the marketing budget should be allocated to the team? No problem. So if I were looking at different different projects within each element of marketing, this would be very different. But let's say I'm just running a standard ad campaign. I know I need somebody to kind of manage everything. I need an SEM specialist, videographer slash designer, whatever. This price does not include the cost of doing it wrong, training, trial and error, all these other things. And, and you really have a difficult time baking that in. But I would add this to kind of the customer acquisition cost as basically the total spend of marketing, all the budgets, all the things combined, fucking rent, all that stuff in order to come up with a real customer acquisition cost and basically get a real gross profit, at which case I can say this thing makes money. Give me more money and I'll make you as much money as you want. As a marketer, that's super powerful. And as the boss, I'm like, I need to keep this person here forever. I will give you as much money as you need if you keep doing that. This is what future proofs us and allows us to become exceptional marketers. I promise it, it's again, not the most exciting thing to see, but it does really work. You can do this across all channels and that allows you to get the top performing channel, top performing campaign, the return on ad spend in total and individually, return on investment per channel, uh, customer acquisition cost, lifetime value, churn, all that good stuff. Like it's super important. Question for the audience, this is not a poll, it's just a general question. What do all these brands have in common? And the answer is that they have all ditched their chief marketing officer. Uh, two years ago, I, I did a, a pretty controversial presentation at a big tech event out here, which was basically showing that the storytellers and the branding folks of, of yesteryear and way back in the day are, are really becoming wedged out of what is the future of marketing, which is, of course, creative. Like, dude, I love getting creative. I love jamming out and coming up with like off the wall crazy shit in order to try it out and have fun. But I know in my heart of hearts that I will not have a job only doing that. We have to be both creative and technical. And I encourage you to try to fight the instincts of like boring, like I don't want this, this is lame. I encourage you to fight the, the tendency to, to kind of slip away from this. Put some numbers against your stuff and see what you can do. And you don't have to use crazy spreadsheets forever. This is crazy. Data entry sucks, I hate it too. I am not a fan. And the way that I work around that is I set up dashboards. Dashboards allows me to track everything so I never have to get into another Google Sheet or Excel file ever again. Once I set it, I forget it and it's done. And I can set up dashboards for you. My favorites are probably Gecko Board and Clipfolio. Plecto is kind of a Danish company and they're new on the scene. Google Data Studio is okay. Holler at your boy, I can set it up for you and it's a lot of fun. Um, I think I have a little bit of time left. Uh, yeah, I think I got a little bit of time. So I wanna do a quick run into like how we forecast without having run ads. I've met so many agencies as a, a, a chief marketing officer and somebody that was leading marketing departments are like, we can't give you forecasts without any data. And it's like, yeah, I know that. So I have historical data, you could use that. There are industry averages and you could put together guesswork. The reality is most marketers do not know how to put together a forecast because nobody's really challenged them to do that. And we need all of these statistics that are listed below in order to make that happen. But guess what? We all have access to the internet. System, it has a bladder. And Jesus it Christ. A shotgun. I don't know what happened hands. there. My phone just like queued up. Uh, <laughs> so long story short, do a Google search for the phrase, whatever your industry is, 
industry average and whatever the metric is, which could be cost per click, could be click through rate, could be whatever, and the platform that you're trying to figure it out for. And you will get all the data you need in order to basically build out projections until the cows come home. And if I really hate data entry and spreadsheets as much as I do, you can also find a lot of these really cool calculators and I've saved you a ton of time and listed out a handful of my favorite ones. They are free, <laughs> which is great. Like you don't have to build this stuff ever again. The shit sucks, it's super boring. So yeah, put together a couple of these and start figuring out, is this actually reflecting what you are expecting? And are you able to tweak the existing calculators enough in order to actually make them work for your business, product, service, campaigns, channels, et cetera. Uh, a couple of little help, helpful insights on forecasting. Set up a baseline if you are like kind of granted the keys to the castle. You're usually going to find out a lot of stuff within the first three months to really know like, cool, we're on to something. I'll spend the next six months optimizing or at least the first six months you know, optimizing. And then after that, I'll know my clear winners. And it's just a matter of continuing to tweak after that. I always give clients two conservative, sorry, two estimates when it comes to like what the channel growth is going to look like. A conservative and a high growth one, I really encourage you to do that. That way your hands aren't tied to like crazy goals. And this is probably one of the most important takeaways in terms of optimizing campaigns. The most effective campaigns are optimized versions of less effective campaigns. I'll say that one more time. The most effective campaigns are the optimized versions of the less effective campaigns. Nobody has a home run at the first step at bat. It's just not there. So you need time to really continue to ramp these up. Uh, this is also one of my favorite questions. Uh, I get this pretty much weekly. What is the least amount of money I can spend on ads? It's like, like for real? Like, why are you talking to an agency? Like, I don't know, you could spend one cent on Quora. So Quora allows you to set a campaign minimum of 0 0.01 or one cent on a CPM campaign. These are numbers that I've put together over the last little while, uh, and they set basically a monthly and a daily low if you wanted to advertise across all these channels. I don't know, I don't know why you would half-ass any of these, but if you really are stuck on like a super low budget and you really have to test and you need statistically significant data, then these are the lowest numbers that I would encourage you to start with. Anything lower than that, you're just not getting enough data. And you know, it's this is kind of like a, a weird caveat, but remember that these different platforms are like apples and oranges. Search ads are so different from skippable in-stream YouTube ads. And I know if you're talking with somebody that's at the very top, it's like, I don't care, just make it work, I like money. Like, yeah, I do too, but the reality is like, I'm not entirely certain if this particular ad channel will work with these types of campaigns. I have to test it out in order to find out. There is no other way of knowing. And by the standard of statistical significance, I dig this shit. Uh, <laughs> you just need to get something in the way of 5,000 impressions. I usually look for a p-value of five. It's basically saying, there is a very slim chance that this will be a random possibility that these results happen in a vacuum randomly. So you know that there is something to the campaigns that you've been running. Uh, just a little note on Facebook ads for testing, uh, two to three days, I would never do it in terms of just running a campaign for two to three days. It's a blind test and you're not getting enough data. Facebook has this interesting algorithm that basically continues to learn how to serve you the right audience based on previous engagement. So after seven days, you kind of see some of the trends happening. By 14 days, the trends have been clarified. And then by 30 days, you have absolute certainty. So bear that in mind, especially for Facebook. Staying structured, I don't have time. I'm not going to stick on that. Um, last little bit, I think I'm getting close to yeah the end here. I'll save a couple of minutes for questions. Influencer marketing. I've been doing a ton of this stuff more recently. Uh, it's in a lot of different B2C segments more specifically cryptocurrency, which I find super interesting. I have not been involved with any rug pulls, but holler at your boy if you're interested in hearing more about it. Um, there are lots of people that speculate how much they make, and there are a lot of people that are liars and full of shit. Um, so I looked at a lot of different averages across a lot of different platforms, forums, and that kind of stuff, and came up with this. I oversimplified it in this next slide, which basically is I look at nano, micro, macro, mid-tier, uh, sorry, nano, micro, mid-tier, macro, and mega. And it gives the number of followers and then across each platform, what range you would statistically spend. I don't know what your industry is, but you would spend on each one for each of those. 
Uh, the more important thing is I focus on the smaller players. So we're talking nano and micro. They consistently have a much higher engagement rate because people are actually following them with great regularity because they haven't gotten too big yet. They have a lot more engagement overall. They're worth the money. Uh, I think a lot of people miss the side of like how expensive it is to actually run in, uh, influencer campaigns. You have discovery, outreach, link tracking, an influencer CRM, video feedback, project management, and a bunch of other shit that I can't even get into. It, it's a minimum of $1,500 just to get things moving. And that's not even when you're bribing people because that's what we're basically doing in order to get them to talk about your product. It's a whole different ball game. You want to get into some real next level stuff? I would love to chat with you, but this is some of the different things that I work on, which is creating artificial, uh, sorry, artificial, artificial virality by building influence pyramids, specifically on TikTok was one that I did. Um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. You have nano people talking upwards and doing duets with micro people. You have micro people talking about mid-level people and it creates what seems like, man, everybody's talking about this crazy thing. And it's like, yeah, it works. So I've found a lot of success with this, but everybody has their own models and different ways of doing it. Uh, and the essence of saving time, I'm going to stop, uh, but I would love to go on for ages about this stuff. I hope this is interesting. My name is Taylor Ryan. I am the CEO, founder, and the crazy person that runs Clint. It's a growth hacking and digital marketing agency. If you want to do some serious growth and you're interested, holler at me. Uh, growth Secrets is my online masterclass. It is $49. Originally, it costs way more than that. I held it in person, transferred it online during COVID. Uh, it's digital marketing and growth hacking 101. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always looking for new connections. I think it's awesome that you guys stuck through it if you did. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Taylor. That was a lot of energy. <laughs> I did have a coffee before I got in here, so that, that might explain it. We do have some Q&A questions. Are you able to navigate to the Q&A section? Yes. So I'll work my way from the, I guess, top down. How can I argue for more budget? I uh, know that we're spending enough on social media if the marketing department budget isn't available to me. That's a great question. Um, so you have to be able to show the what's in it for me. Uh, this is where we kind of put on our sales hat. And if you have numbers on return on investment, I think you're going to be able to sit there and say like, cool, here are the different channels. We have organic, referral, direct, uh, paid social, paid search, and other, whatever. And if you can say with some level of certainty that, look, we have 5% of all of our conversions coming through on paid social, uh, you know, we should be putting a little more into this and I might be able to get that to 10%. If I had a 10% increase on total leads, what would that mean for your bottom line? If you can put numbers to things, it's like a really weird example and a bad example at that. If you can put numbers to things, people will listen. So I really encourage you to try to put as much data to it. And most of the time people are too lazy to look up sources and figure stuff out. So I, I would say that you can show numbers. You're going to, you're going to actually have somebody listen to you. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. Does that uh, eight to 10, uh, just skipped. Oh, wait, does the eight to 10% 8 of spend on marketing include third party agencies for things outside of social media PPC? Yeah. So like one of the more frustrating things that I came into uh, as I was checking out this CMO and you can look it up. It's Deloitte, the CMO study or CMO survey, whatever it is. Um, there was this really small section there that was saying a lot of companies, like 70% of companies admitted to looking at in-housing all of their marketing stuff that they had normally gone through agencies. The problem with doing everything in-house is that ultimately like you have this, unfortunate echo chamber where whoever sits at the top kind of calls the shots and it's really difficult to like challenge those people, especially when you're not at the top. And there's a lot of people, it's like, I know what I want. I want newspapers and magazines all day. And it's like, that shit doesn't work. Like it hasn't worked in 20 years and it's really difficult to, to argue with it. So if you are trying to create some wedge between a, a, just a bullheaded manager that won't listen, that's the way to do it. Uh, I'm an agency, so of course I'm impartial, especially if you're starting early. I would say agencies can be the way to go, but over time you should absorb more and more of what the agency is doing because I hate 
perpetual agencies. I think they're the worst. Like there's no reason you should pay a company to do the same thing, you know, month over month for two years. That's crazy. Um, uh, let's see. Will the slide deck be available? Yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn for the slide decks. Um, I will give you the full, like, everything that's there. So long as you're not a competing agency, then you have to go through Falcon to get it. Um, sorry, I'm just not going to hook people up. I see people, like, taking my stuff all the time, and it's like, all right, awesome. Like, I'm constantly evolving, but, yeah. So the slide decks will be available. Connect with me on LinkedIn and ask about it. Um, what is the ideal budget for LinkedIn ad testing? Oh, so if we go back... What's up? On the screen, there's um, there was one that I, the decent size. Oh, I missed it. Okay. I have a decent sized budget for influencer marketing, but my leadership is always pushing back uh, for me to spend less. How do I show them uh, that uh, the spend is worth it? So a few different things. It depends on the platform that you're using. It's going to be a little more challenging to do any type of link tracking depending on the platform that you're on. Link tracking gives the influencer a custom link so that they're able to either give a discount or at the very least you can show and tag and tribute everybody that came through that link over. Uh, and that's incredibly powerful to be like, look, we just got a huge amount of people that came through and a huge amount of orders that specifically came through that one single influencer that just gave us a quick shout out. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is, yeah, I mean, it, I would say general attribution, you can see spikes when you run these campaigns. But if you're doing like a super heavy influencer pyramid, it starts to get messy. And, and sometimes, yeah, it's not entirely possible to, to do attribution. Uh, the other side of it is a lot of people are blocking a lot of different tracking pixels. And so it makes it really difficult to see exactly where and how people uh, converted. And, and that's been the bane of my existence for at least the last few months with uh, the iOS update. So yeah, uh, long answer is show numbers. Sorry, I, I'm glad that people are adding me on LinkedIn, but I have like a thousand tabs open. So just bear with me guys, you're getting that. Um, I think I got that question. Uh, and by the way, I'll stick around for as long as people are uh, sticking around. I, I got nothing else to do, I guess. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on uh, the trend of live shopping. Are we talking about live shopping from the standpoint of uh, like TikTok? I, I mean, there's, are you talking about like people going into like retail? I, I mean, there's lots of different ways to tackle this, but yeah, I would say that there's a number of really interesting case studies that have come. Like, why do you guys think that Walmart was looking at acquiring TikTok? Because they really want to grab a younger segment, but they also know that young people are far more likely to buy from somebody that is somewhat familiar uh, to them. And so, yeah, influencers have a ton of power on that platform and it's expanding. So, yeah, I would definitely say that it's it's not a trend, it's it's a thing and it, it's working really well. So if you're in any type of like consumer goods and a B2C play, you should have been doing influencer strategies like years ago. But yeah, get in touch with me and I'm happy to, to start working on stuff. But it's a great question. Uh, ideal budget for uh, LinkedIn ad testing. I, I kind of went over that, uh, and I'm not going to pull up the slides. Um, but you know, it. it you, <laughs> oh, let me go back. Hold on. So, like, I did set like a uh, a minimum. So, like, the daily low budget for LinkedIn, if you're just testing, is hundred dollars. LinkedIn is by far the most expensive platform, and it sucks because a lot of my clients are B2B companies. But again, like you have this really laser focus, this spear versus the net type of, of fishing. So it is worth it, depending on the nature of, of the purchase. But yeah, I, I run a lot of uh, B2B LinkedIn ads and the minimum is hundred bucks a day. And you'll go through that like, yeah, like nothing. So yeah, next question. Uh, how do you keep your small in-house C-suite on track uh, to staying with an agency? Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that we're talking about how do you keep a, a, the executives at your company uh, on, on the same page and open to working with an agency. The greatest thing that an agency can do is provide weekly standups that are a really high level report. And I have tons of clients that do this now. They basically go to board meetings with my, my weekly report uh, and as well as the monthly one. Uh, which is basically just showing the big numbers that everybody wants to see. Like we spent this, we got this, this is the amount of leads, this is the traction that's happening on these different channels, these are the things that we're testing out. Hot damn, we love these guys, they keep making us money. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, by that question, uh, yeah, you should definitely reach out to me because like that's the shit that we do. So I would love to help you out. How about incorporating CTV advertising? I don't know what CTV is. Is that closed television advertising? Does anybody know what that is? I'll bet it's something interesting. And maybe I don't know that. Um, is it traditional TV advertising? I, I wouldn't spend a cent on that, to be totally honest. Most people are texting during commercials, if they're ever watching commercials, because like, who really watches terrestrial TV or listens to like old radio anymore? We all have like smartphones and Netflix and stuff. So like, I would I would dump every bit of advertising that I had on that, like 100% and more. <laughs> but I don't know if that's the question. So I, I would need more specifics. Feel free I, to reach yeah, out. I believe they they were referring to like connected television traditional ad. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that. Experience. Experience. Okay. I wish I had more experience with it. Um, I, if I, yeah, if I had more experience, I'd have an opinion, but I, I haven't used it, so I don't know. What's damn? That's a good question, Nina. <laughs> we do everything. Uh, full service marketing. So every every solution is tailored. Depends on the nature of the business and all these other things, but. We do a, uh, an audit and understand exactly what we can help you with. And then whether it's ads, creative content, SEO, inbound marketing, outbound marketing, general growth hacks across the board, you name it, we do it. Um, I know everybody wants to say like, like here's my jam. So like everybody's like, oh, you should go into like a really like narrow field and do like social media. And it's like, fuck that. I want to learn as much as I can. And one of the most interesting ways that you can learn lots of stuff is by trying lots of things. Look, guys, the only reason that I was able to create this presentation is because I've tried so many different things. You can do that too. And that's one of the hardest things to convince your boss. If you know you have somebody to report to is like, we need to try something different because if we continue doing the same thing, we're only going to get the same results. That's how you can sometimes overcome this. Like, I don't know. It doesn't sound like it would work to me. It's like, well, let's fucking try. And I love trying different things. So that's kind of part of why I created an agency was to be able to get to work on tons of different cool projects, cool companies. And, and so far, yeah, it's been an absolute blast. But yeah, if you're really interested, uh, feel free to check us out, clintmarketing.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, to, so there was a, uh, just a clarification, like connected TV is for like smart television, that interface uh, that like sometimes there are advertisements that are placed there that that was the um, spe uh, specification on that Got it. Yeah, again, I've I've read about that. I have never had Yeah, I've never had a campaign where I've actually put it to work So I yeah, I couldn't really I wouldn't want to advise somebody on something I've never tested myself. So I wish I had a good answer, but I just yeah, I haven't done it do you think yeah, investing? In, I'm gonna, okay. Do you think investing in social media uh, ad influencer marketing is still worth a try? While the industry characteristics are less engaging with social media, such as welding manufacturing industry. So, like that's that's a really interesting play. If it's a B two B company, then yeah, you have a you have a really like snowball's chance in hell that like a 20 year old influence is like, God, I love like manufacturing. This is my new welder's mask. Like that's not going to go anywhere. You do not stand a chance of really getting anything happening with influencers on rare occasions. You might find like a cool uh, welder channel on, on, you know, YouTube, but by and large, I would say you have to start looking at the watering holes. The watering holes are where people congregate in the Savannah, you know, like where animals go to drink and that's where people maybe go to bitch and moan. And, I found this with very specific industries like structural engineers and architects. They love Facebook groups. And maybe there is something to the welding or manufacturing folks that is in either some type of, yeah, I don't know, very narrow like forum or, or there's an area, but you have to kind of dig into each industry. It just depends. But I found that, yeah, uh, wherever people tend to go to kind of get things off their chest, that's one of the best places to figure out what they talk about and figure out where and what they're actually asking and where they're going to get those answers from those places. Um, so Facebook groups, uh, Reddit, uh, depending on the nature of, of the industry, Discord, so many different kind of congregations and, and groups. I hope that was helpful. 
I know we're over, uh, our session is officially over. We're you putting, uh, and, and all of these other questions will be answered by our team. I, um, but uh, just wanted to make okay. sure we were on point for time. Cool. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm down to stick around uh, if it goes over. Um, but yeah, I understand if people want to hit the road as well. So. Do you see on the right hand side, right, uh, all of the Q and A's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can run through it. So if I hit publish, we'll yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I can stick around. That's no problem. Cool. Well, thanks, Andre. It's been an absolute pleasure, my man. Thank you. Same. Likewise. Really appreciate the session. Cool. Well, I'll continue to work through these for the amount of time that people want to stick around. Uh, I have connected insight tags to my LinkedIn ads uh, on ads uh, as well uh, as UTM. I see as, as UTMs. Yeah, so you definitely have to create unique UTMs uh, for LinkedIn. If you haven't done that, you're <laughs> you're going to have a really difficult time measuring campaigns. I don't see website visits on Google Analytics. That could be a very specific instance. That could also be the nature of I don't know. I assume you might be in Europe, so. If you have a GDPR uh, cookie kind of accepting uh, plugin, depending on the nature of your site, this basically washes all that data away. Or depending on the way that you've set up your UTMs, it could be too generalized, but it's a really specific thing. I'd have to go into each individual campaign, but cool question, man. Um, yeah, definitely, or lady, uh, definitely reach out. I think that's cool. Let me jump on the next one. So how do you switch to more modern marketing vehicles when our internal teams believe our audience 55 plus is not on digital? Uh, they want to run TV commercials and brochures. Fucking leave that company. Um, <clears throat> I, I would say that that's pretty consistent with a lot of companies that I've worked with uh, in the past. And unfortunately, like that's the way that dinosaurs think. It's like, well, nothing's ever going to change. It's always been this way. It'll always work that way which to me is an opportunity. And at some point you're gonna to continue to bang your head against the wall because you're having to do the things that don't scale, that don't work. And unfortunately, uh, they're not really appreciated where even if you do a great job, they'll be like, yeah, that was a fluke though. We're gonna go back to doing ads you know, in old folks magazines. I have no idea. Who's really reading magazines anymore? Like that's crazy. And TV commercials, like that's cute. But I mean, if we tested something against it, you'd be able to see fairly quickly that the ROI is just non-comparable. Like a lot of people are in this scary world where they can't point to data to be able to say what they're doing is actually working. So Jenna, yeah. I mean, if you're looking at testing different things and you can't seem to get any, any movement in there, these people are not gonna change no matter how convincing you are. So yeah, start looking at a different company. Go test that shit where it actually counts in a different company and, and I think you'd be surprised like people will take those ideas head on. So unfortunately, I don't know if that was the answer you're looking for, but <laughs> but yeah, there it is. Uh, let's see, the next one, let me do that one. I have connected, oh, I already did that, Mark has answered, cool. Uh, is it worth, let me publish that one. Is it worth it if you are in an industry that Facebook and Instagram constantly flagging you, such as firearms industry? Yeah, so like that's one of the more interesting things. So whether it's uh, gambling, uh, cryptocurrency, firearms, pornography, sex toys, uh, any of these kind of fringe areas, like you're never gonna get it through. So like I had a, a friend that was in a co-working space that was building a, kind of like a couple's box of the month club and sometimes there would be yeah, toys and, and lube and that kind of stuff. And some campaigns got through and many of them consistently got flagged. So that's not gonna be your jam. That's not your channel, unfortunately. There are other channels that you can go through, other ad networks and different things to try. So unfortunately, yeah, that's a tough one. And yeah, Google doesn't help you out either. I was doing a couple of like really crazy deep dives on Ahrefs, which is an awesome platform for SEO. And they basically don't allow crawling for a lot of firearms and, and gun manufacturers. And I'm not a gun guy at all. It's just, I, I think it's kind of crazy that they're blocking out an entire industry, but I don't know, man, there's different ad networks for it. Um, and that's a tough one. Um, but the way that you can do it is, yeah, lots of uh, different blogs that you can get guests posted in different places. And sometimes they don't mind where it comes from. So something to think about. 
Uh, Mark just answered, uh, publish. <clears throat> Any opinion on geofencing and display target ads? Hell yeah. So whenever I do big conferences, whether it's Slush, which is like a big one out in Europe, or Startup Summits, or uh, what was it? A handful of like 30,000, 40,000 plus people, I always do geotagging. Uh, you can get as close as one kilometer. Um, and that's phenomenal if you know that everybody who is a visitor from out of town that is in my geofence off area is probably in town for this event. Stop by booth number 58 to play ball. Additionally, if you're working on local businesses, which I imagine this is more likely the case, then yeah, totally makes sense that you should be doing geofencing and display ads. You can do lots of cloned ads that are talking about the surrounding zip code, the surrounding city and all that stuff. So yeah, um, totally go for it. I think it's an awesome idea and there's lots of growth acts that basically allow you to get even closer into geotargeting by omitting different area codes that surround it. Uh, so you're chopping away just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, so you know a, a smaller area. Great question. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. Mark just answered. <clears throat> I think that's all of them. Um, let's see. CTV. I think that's everybody. And if you have any more questions, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I don't know, guys. I, I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope it was a little different than maybe what you had gotten earlier. Uh, and, you know, I, I have a bit more energy because I dig this stuff. So I, I really hope people got something out of it. And again, thank you for sitting in for as long as you have. And uh, feel free to connect with me. And yeah, best of luck with everything. Thanks, guys.